Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the seminar. Uh, again, my name is Xin Gao. I'm a second year PhD student in applied economics and management. My field of concentration is agricultural economics and development economics. Uh, I am a 2015 AWARE grant winner, which, as my advisor has just introduced, allowed me to travel to China. So I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. The presentation I'm going to do today is from my research last semester. So like the thing I did in China this summer was like a pre-survey for my, for my future research, which I will be talking about at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation. What well, this one is like uh, about the prudence and gender differences in terms of risk perceptions and informal lending in rural China, which is also linked to my research in the social networks and social interactions in rural China. Uh, and another interesting thing is that the data for this research is collected from the same area I visited this summer. So the outline for today is that I will first introduce what has motivated my research, and then I'll talk about the data collection process since it's our own data. And then I'll go into the details of the statistical and regression approach we used. Uh, since it's a very interdisciplinary seminar. I won't be going into too much details of the technicalities of econometrics. I will just focus on the intuition and the results and the policy, imp um, policy implications here. So after I do a conclusion, I will talk briefly about what I'm working on now. So what has motivated this research is actually the rural, mi rural out-migration phenomenon that I read about a while ago. So as male labor force migrate out from the rural area into the city area, uh, there has been a huge structural change within households in rural China. So as male moved out, female has become the literate leader of the households. They are in charge of the agricultural production and financial markets in each household. So I'm interested to see how this change um, and how the psychological differences between gender will be reflected in the way they manage the financial matters of their households. In particular, I want to look at um, the gender differences in terms of their risk aversion and how this risk attitudes, risk preferences will, will be reflected in their informal lending behaviors. Informal lending is also a very unique and popular phenomenon in many developing countries because, well, some of the farmers do not have access to enough credits in rural market. They tend to borrow from their relatives and friends. The advantage is that it's really fast, and it doesn't involve interest rates, and you don't need any collateral. But it's itself uh, a very risky behavior, because if you lend to someone, he doesn't return the money, you will lose your investment for your next year's production. So I wish to test the links before people's risk preferences and how they choose to lend to others. The policy implications here will be threefold. First, it has to do with the gender inequalities with, within the household. So who is like, male or female who will be the naturally uh, suitable leader of the household? The second and third has to do with the market potential of rural insurance and rural banking. So as people, as the household leaders become women, they tend to be more careful. Then insurance will be more attractive and informal lending should be less attractive. So formal banking channels will have a potential market expansion in rural China. So I'll talk about the data collection process. Uh, these research is based on a set of household survey data from China, which is conducted in collaboration of, with the Northwestern Agriculture and Forestry University in Shanxi. Uh, I also used the same data set for my master research, but I wasn't uh, physically present during the data collection process. So it was really an interesting experience to be able to go back to where the data was collected five years ago and I worked with five years ago. 
uh, the data was collected in rural Shanxi and Gansu. So if you look at this map, it's like this area here. And this is just, this picture is one of the typical villages we visited. In the survey, we ask uh, whether their household leaders are male or female so that we will be able to divide them into two groups later. Uh, in the survey, we focused on households that rely on agriculture production as their primary uh, source of income to make sure that they really care about the questions we ask about. There are four groups of questions that are used in this research. The first three has to do with their risk perceptions, and the last one is about their informal lending. So the idea is that we build some indices that will allow us to do a comparison, and then we do a regression to test the relationship between risk aversion and informal lending. So the first set of the questions is about people's awareness of production risks. In the questionnaire, we ask two questions. One is about price risk, the other one is about yield risk. So in the, in the analysis, we use both sets of data, but for time concern, we only present the price risk here. We first ask what their primary crops are, then we ask each respondent to give us three numbers. Uh, the highest possible price for next crop here, the lowest possible price, and the most likely price. And we use these three data points to fit into a distribution, the probability distribution for each person. So if you look at this picture, you can think about the yellow one and the blue one as two typical Chinese farmers. Uh, for the yellow one, he's a uh, per perceived lowest possible price is here, and highest possible price is over there. But instead of a mean price here, his mode is slightly skewed to the right. So the, the area on the right-hand side under the, the green curve is larger. This means that the person is putting greater weight, like betting more on the chance that he will get a good price next year. In contrast, the, the blue person is skewed to the left. So he's more pessimistic about his, his, pos his price next year. So in this way, we try to use this skewness measure as, as an index for their awareness of production risks. This allows us to like, build an index that is comparable across person because it's normalized. So if you have zero, it means your mode is right in the middle. If you have a negative score, you're more like the yellow person. If you have a positive score, you're scaled to the left. You're more like the blue person. This is just how the formula we use to build the index. So we already have our first index. The next index I want, we want to build is their willingness to take risk. So in the questionnaire, we ask three questions. One is about their willingness to take greater production risk to increase profit. The next one is their willingness to take, new, take up new technologies before they see the result. The third one is about uh, taking up new management practices before they see the good result. We want to use these three dimensions of the same question to build an index so the easiest way to do this is to just take a simple average. We add them up and divide it by three. But this approach has a, pro has a problem because each question is equally weighted. But it's entirely possible that in reality, one of the dimension dominates. So you should have put greater weight on that dimension. Then if you just take the simple average, it will be a not very accurate measure. So to deal with this problem, we use the principal component analysis to build a score for each farmer. Uh, the intuition is that we reduce dimension by, by picking a, an axis that can explain the greatest variation in the data set. So if you think the x-axis as the technology and y-axis as a uh, 
management, uh, you can see that the two dimensions, the scores are linearly correlated. So you just take, you draw a new line across the direction that has the largest variation and draw another orthogonal axis and rotate it to build a new coordinate system. This way you will have the weight for each of the new axes and you can calculate a more accurate weighted average for each farmer. So we use this method to build the second index. The third index we want to build is about their activities in preventing risk. So we ask them to evaluate the importance of uh, the following eight risk management tools on a scale of one to five. Uh, they are crop diversification, geographic diversification, irrigation, uh, spreading sales, contracts, which is just like financial derivatives, and government programs, financial services, and off-farm investment. Then we use exactly the same method, the principal component score, to build an index for their actions. So now we have the complete set of indices. We just use a statistical analysis, which is as simple as a t-test, to compare the difference between uh, female household leaders and male household leaders. Here is our result. Uh, this is the result for their awareness for risks. So as we can see from the table, the sample size for male is, is like over 500 and for female is only 66. So this shows that in rural China, male still dominates the household leader dis uh, position, which is very natural according to the Chinese traditional value. And we can tell from the mean score that male is negative, which if you recall the, the yellow person and the, the blue person, male household leaders are more skilled to the right, which means they're more confident about the price they're gonna receive next year. While the female, female leaders have a positive score, so they're more like the, the blue person who are conservative about their estimation. And we use a t-test that accounts for group size differences and unequal variances within each group to compare the difference. Um, and the p-value is 0, 0.4, so it's very significant. Uh, we can say that the female household leaders are more aware of their production risks. Similarly, we did another test for their willingness to take risk. So it's Remember, the, the scores were on a scale of one to five. The higher the score is, the more the person is willing to take production risk. So we can see that male household leaders have a positive score, and female are negative. So no, the, the reason why it has positive and negative is because I normalize it. So the mean is zero now, so it's symmetric. Uh, when we do the comparison, we find that the t-score t, t score is not very significant. That is because the, the standard deviation, standard error within the female group is huge. It's like three times as large as the male group. So it's very hard to get a significant result. But we are still at the 90% confidence level able to say that uh, male household leaders are more willing to take production risks than female. The last set of results is for their actions, the actions they actually take to prevent risks. So again, we can see that male group has a negative score, a female group has a positive score. So, and the p-value here is very significant. We can say that uh, female, group, female household leaders are more active in hedging risks. So the, the previous, three sets of results have consistently shown that we can say female household leaders are more prudent in terms of financial matters management within household. They are more aware of production risks, they are less willing to take risks, and they are more active in actually hedging risks. So having this result in mind, our next goal, next goal is to test how this risk version risk preference 
will be related to their informal lending behaviors. So uh, it's natural to think about the intuition because informal lending is itself a risky behavior. So if you are risk averse, you will not put yourself into so much danger. And we have found evidence from psychology literature that it is actually so. But I, I didn't see anyone have done the econometric analysis in terms of economics terms. So I think, yeah, we're the first one as far as I know. The dependent variable here we use is the informal lending. So it's more like whether you have ever lent to a relative or a friend. And the independent variables here we use, along with the three risk indices we used before, are propensities to trust, uh, expectation for reciprocity, uh, gender, and a series of demographic control variables. The reason why we include these variables is because we had a theoretical model that has shown us these variables should be included, but for the time concern, we don't have time to develop the whole model here. So let's just assume that they are indeed important. We use the same set of data from the, the survey we did. So on the, on the informal lending, the, the dependent variable side, we ask uh, each respondent if they have ever lent money to a relative or a friend. So if they did, their, their score is one. If not, we have a zero. And on the independent variable side, we have their propensity to trust. So we ask each respondent, if you lend money to your relative or friend, you trust that they will give you the money back. And this is evaluated on a scale of one to five. <coughs> we also have a set of questions on reciprocity, which is defined as uh, if I lend to, if I, if I lend, to, lend money to you, it's because I have borrowed money from you before. So when you ask me, I have the responsibility to do the same for you. Uh, so we ask the respondents whether they have ever borrowed money from a relative or a friend. Then we also have two questions on trust reciprocity. So this will be used as an instrumental variable in our later analysis. Uh, trust reciprocity here is defined as uh, I, I, trust, I trust that you will pay back my money because I know that you trust. I will return your money if you lend money to me. <laughs> so we ask them uh, if they actually think so. And this is also evaluated on a scale of one to five. So we have our data set here we use a set of regression to identify the relationship. Since we have the independent variable, a uh, dependent variable as zero and one, we use a probit model here. So if they have lent to relatives of, and friends, y is one, otherwise it's zero. And we put all the risk measures, uh, trust, reciprocity, gender, and other control variables on the right-hand side. So it's easy, um, regarding the model, it's easy to see that there is an endogeneity issue between the lending variable and the trust variable because it's determined simultaneously. Like, I, I lend money to you because I trust you. But on the other, other hand, I trust you because I have lent money to you and you have returned it to me. Or I don't trust you because I lent money to you and you didn't return it to me. So it's like a two-direction relationship. You cannot tell um, which direction is the causality. So to deal with this problem, we use the instrumental variable approach, which is a classical model in econometrics. So the instrument we use here is the trust reciprocity thing we just constructed before. So we can say that it's reasonable to say that trust reciprocity is highly correlated with trust itself, but it only affects lending behavior through trust, but not like directly. So here's the result. We have four equations. 
uh, two equations for the two identifications for relatives and the other two for friends. The probit here are the models that uh, without accounting for endogeneity and the IVs are the ones that accounted for endogeneity. So what we can observe from the result is first of all, reciprocity plays a huge role in determining lending behavior. So if I had borrowed money from you before, it's more likely that I will lend money to you, which is natural. Uh, we also find that willingness to take risk has a positive impact on informal lending behavior. So if I'm more willing to take risk, I will tend to lend if you ask me to, if, to borrow money. So um, oh, there is another thing, trust, the trust variable is only significant in the friend's identification, but not in the relative's identification. My understanding is that in China, in the traditional Chinese value, relatives are still considered as, as families. So when you lend money to them, you don't need much trust. While for friends, it's still considered outside, so trust may play a role in that relationship. Uh, we observe that gender plays a very ambiguous role in this identif identification. It's sometimes negative, sometimes positive, and not significant. But if we think about what we had before, for the willingness, the risk measures, men and women differ significantly. So we can see that the effect may have gone through the willingness variable. We, we, sh we could have done a cross term here to identify the relationship, but the intuition is already easy to see from this. So if men, we, female leaders are less willing to take risk, they are less likely to be involved into informal lending behaviors. So here comes the conclusion of my research. Uh, we have two sets of key results. The first set has to do with their risk perceptions. So from the statistical analysis and our three indices, we found that female household leaders are uh, more aware of production risk, less willing to take risk, and are more active in risk management. Uh, the second test, uh, the second set of key results has to do with risk perception and informal lending. We find that since female household leaders are more risk, risk averse, they are less likely to be involved into informal lending behavior. So the policy implications here is first of all, um, we have to think about the traditional value of Chinese households. So in, in Chinese, in the long history of Chinese value, we have always believed that male are more natural to be the household leaders because they are considered wise, strong, courageous, daring. They, they can do anything they want, while female has been on the sub subordinate position. But this set of research has revealed that it's not necessarily so because female household leaders has a huge advantage. They are more careful, they're more prudent. It's especially important in the rural setting because there are not many risk managed tools. And if you are too willing to take risk, you will probably ruin your household. So I, I hope that this will help alleviate to some extent the, the household gender inequality issues in rural China. The second one has to do with the market expansion of rural insurance and banking. So like for the research we're working on now, we have seen that uh, a large proportion of rural China has, it is still unbanked or only partially banked. So if we think that the household structure is changing, female, the more prudent people have become the leaders. They are actually managing the financial matters of the households, we have reason to believe that they will be more willing to take up insurance. And instead of borrowing with relatives and friends, they are more likely to take up the formal financial channels. So there may be a huge market potential in rural insurance and banking with the 
household, household structure change. I just don't know how big that might be. So now I want to introduce briefly about what I'm currently working on and what I did this summer. I, my current research is about the social interaction and social network and its, effect, its effects on the public goods provision in rural China. So after the elimination of rural tax in 2005, we have observed that the public good provision has been under the optimal level. The new mechanism is that uh, the villagers collectively propose something that they want to build, like they want to build a school, they want to build a road, and then the whole village votes on, on the project they pro proposed. If it's passed with two-thirds of the votes, it will be uh, reported to the county level. Then the county level approves and send it back so the village leaders can collect money from the from the villagers to build the project. This has created a huge problem because it's very hard to reach agreement. Like, first of all, you cannot reach agreement on the proposal, then, then when you vote, you cannot reach a collective decision. This has to do with the special structure of the rural society in China because it's really scattered. People are organized along the same surnames. So like, it's more like the lineage groups. If we have the same surname, we are likely to build our own projects instead of interacting with other people and share public goods with other, other surnames. And also, we have many other groups in China, like church groups, temple groups, women groups, and the uh, self-help groups organized by various kinds of people. And they don't interact with people and their values do not agree with each other. So it has been really difficult in China to, like, to coordinate these relationships. So my research has to do with like, how the social interactions, how those uh, social groups are working in the rural public goods provision mechanism and how does social group participation affect each villager's deviation from the collect collective decision. And from there, I want to research about what might be the optimal mechanism to ensure an optimal public goods level. So here are some of the works we did this summer. We interviewed, we went to rural China to interview with the village leaders as well as the group leaders. So I think the best idea to understand the structure of the villages is to talk with the village leaders. They're amazing, they know everyone, they know everything that is going on. So by talking to them, we have at least been able to identify what groups are in existence and which group is in conflict and which groups are working together. And we have also interviewed with group leaders. So like after we identify, identify those groups, we actually interview some of the leaders. Uh, this lady here is one of the female group leaders in the village. So she organizes all the women in the village to dance together every night to produce handcrafts to sell on the market so that female can make some income as well. Uh, the old lady in the middle is the temple leader. She works for the temple and lives in the temple. And she introduced a lot about how the festivals are organized, how the contributions to the temples are organized, and what are their conflicts with other relig religious groups. Uh, that guy over at the right hand side is the leader of a handicapped people self-help self -help group. He organized a handicapped people in the whole county to produce the bamboo chair and sell them on the market. So it's really, it's independent of the handicapped people union that is organized by the government. And he has been talking about what their conflicts are, the, the non-governmental and the governmental side, and how he thinks might be the optimal way to organize 
people who have lost their ability to work to improve their, li uh, their living standard. So we, found, we have found that there is a huge solidarity uh, within each group, and their, but their beliefs and concepts are very different across those groups. So I'm trying to find a way to do some, like to actually map out the relationship among between each villager so that we can be we can we will be able to do a more detailed an analysis in the future so the, this has been a very important trip to my research and i also want to talk talk about one thing i learned from this trip it's it's about my identi identity as an agriculture economist like from this trip, I have learned that as an economist, especially as an agriculture economist, it's not enough to just sit at school, look at data, download someone else's data, and just program, because you will lose so much fun as well as the realities of the real world in your research. For example, if we, uh, about the previous research that I did, if you only look at the data points, you have income of each household, the time series data that is increasing, and the insurance take-up rate that is increasing. You are likely to conclude that there is an income effect. As people become richer, they will take up more insurance, micro 101. But that's not the case in rural China if you really go there and observe, because it's actually the husband moved out to work in the city, so they are richer now. And the more proven, prudent female is now leading the household, so they are buying more insurance. So there are so many things going on beyond the data you can observe, and you will never be able to understand the mechanism unless you go to rural China, visit them, and talk to the people. So yeah, I, I have been always fascinated with fancy uh, econometrics models and mathematics, and I spent so much time during my first year here I still think they are important, cool, but now I understand that they are not enough if, if you don't understand the reality. And so after I travel to those villages and talk to people this summer, I, when I look at the 800 household survey data again, they are not, no longer just 800 data points, but they are more real. They are 800 lives, 800 stories, so I think the, this trip has motivated me to think more deeply about my future res research, and I, I think I'm more determined to do more field work so that I can understand the reality. And I think those lives are also the motivation for my future research, because I now understand that back in my home country, some people are waiting for me to make a difference for them. So. Thank you again for coming to today's seminar.